Well, good morning, church. Family, glad to see everybody. Glad to have you here today. Uh, We are eating together today. We want you to stay. Uh, We want you to stay to eat with us. If you didn't know about it or didn't bring anything, that's all right. uh, The chicken strips were ordered, so the rest of the sides are here, but we want you to hang around with us. Now, I've got a challenge. I want you to sit with somebody either you don't know or you don't visit with a whole lot or just meet somebody new and get to know somebody and what their background is and how they're doing. But we want you here. Um, We're going to continue on with our series, and I uh, started a series last week from the book of Acts, but it's not so much a textual breakdown verse by verse like I, I like to do. It's more of a view of what the Holy Spirit did in the book of Acts because sometimes, folks, we miss it. The Holy Spirit is mentioned in the book of Acts 58, 59, 60 times. If you put all three synoptic gospels together, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Holy Spirit is mentioned more in Acts than those three together. It's obvious that what's happened is in in the gospels you have the words and the works of Jesus. Luke says that because Luke Acts is one book, actually, or a combination book. And what's happening is you're going from the works of Jesus until Jesus hands off that work to his people, the church. Uh, The Holy Spirit's mentioned more in Acts than it is in 1 Corinthians and Romans put together. This this book, yes, some would say, well, it's about the church. Well, it is, and as much as it's the story of the Holy Spirit working through the church. And we got to go back to it, because sometimes we look at the book of Acts to find rules and regulations and standards and processes, and if you do that, you're, you're doing it backwards. We've got to look at what God does in the book of Acts. And so that's what this series is about. Because a lot of people think, when they think of the Holy Spirit, they think, well, the Holy Spirit doesn't do stuff today anymore. Well, folks, if that's true, then we're trying to build a church. We're trying to live a life. We're trying to be married. We're trying to deal with difficult people. We're trying to deal with health problems all on our own power. Well, how's that working for you? That's a Dr. Field question. You know, if, if that's what we're doing, then we are doomed to fail because we don't have the power we need to do any of those things I just mentioned. Only God's got that power, and he gives us that power with his Holy Spirit. And so what I'm seeking to do with us is, is I'm trying to, if your eyes aren't open to the Holy Spirit, I want to just let a little crack in, and I want us more aware of God's activities in our life and more of what God is doing. And and I want to say to us, you can't put the Holy Spirit in a bottle, folks, any more than you can put God in a box. And so people say, well, I don't see the stuff of the first century. I don't see tongues like that. I don't see people raised from the dead. Folks, do you think the, the Holy Spirit can't adapt to different cultures? Do you think the Holy Spirit would approach a 21st century American, the same way he would approach a 1st century Jew or Greek? No, the Holy Spirit is here, but you've got to learn to see him and and what he does. And so in Acts chapter 2, we've got the day of Pentecost. Well, what is that? Well, I'm not going to give you a huge Jewish lesson, but I'll just say this. The day of Pentecost is 50 days, penta means 50. It's 50 days after Passover. Now, Passover to Pentecost also represents the harvest time. Passover, you plant your grain. Pentecost, you you pull it up. You you reap it. Okay? And so this was originally a festival. It was an agricultural festival to celebrate God's blessings and what God does. And so on the day of Pentecost, you'd offer bread loaves and goats and sheep and bulls. And it was a big, big festival. Well, eventually, the day of Pentecost became a day to remember when Moses got the law off of Mount Sinai and brought it down. And so they would celebrate that on Pentecost. Let's remember the law, God's great teaching. Well, on this day in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit takes the day of Pentecost and changes its meaning. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit changes things. The Holy Spirit changes meaning. He can take a festival and make it mean something entirely different than what it meant the day before. But here's the impact on us and what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit will change your name. The Holy Spirit will change your name from lost to saved, from hopeless to full of hope. He'll change your name from adulterer or thief, and he'll he'll obliterate it. 
he'll, he'll, he'll take away the, the title you carry sometimes as guilt or shame or regret or remorse. And he'll take all those things and the Holy Spirit will completely change you. And he'll set you free from all of those chains. And he's doing it constantly. And he's doing it constantly in your life if we'll just be aware of what's going on. And so here they are in the book of Acts and they're waiting. Now, it's really important. I've told you before, sometimes you've got to wait on the Spirit. You can't tell him what to do. He does what he's going to do, but he does respond to us. And in another verse, boy, I'd love to share with you, and I will at some point, how when you can't pray, when you've got no words, when you're so broken, you've been there? Absolutely, man. There's times where I don't even know what to say. I'm so messed up, and I don't know what the answers are, and I don't know what the things ought to happen. So I just sit there in silence and say, Holy Spirit, would you read me like Braille? And tell Jesus what it is he needs to hear about me because I don't know. The Spirit does all that stuff. And so they're waiting on the Spirit. And, and then this mighty sound. Now, I didn't say everything got blown away, okay? It says a sound like a mighty rushing wind enters this room. And everybody outside of it, man, they can hear this sound. And, and there's like tongues of fire, electricity, a glow. Something enters the room and it falls on the apostles. And man, everybody, it's got their attention. The Holy Spirit will get your attention. He's still doing that today. The Holy Spirit is still getting people's attention by the way you live and the way you act and the way you talk and the way we minister and the way we hold together and the way we worship. The Holy Spirit is constantly giving testimony to his activity around us. And people are attracted to it. And folks, you got to see. You got to see a little boy last week first person I ever know of in this church that, is ra that, that has held hands up while praying was a little boy. How old is he? Nine years old. And folks, don't miss that. That's not just a little boy with a good heart. That's not just a little boy that had a moment. That's a little boy that is responding to God. And we got to look at that and go, boy, that's Holy Spirit right there. And when you see Holy Spirit in that, you learn not to touch it. And if somebody says, man, I don't know if you can raise your hands while you're praying. That's kind of Pentecostal. Folks, when you see the Spirit, you don't question it. It's like when I walk into churches and maybe I don't agree or don't like everything they do. It doesn't matter. When I see two, 300 people flood the aisles and they're baptizing and converting 700, 800 people a year, that's holy ground and I ain't questioning nothing. When you see the Spirit, you get quiet. And here's a little nine-year-old praying like this. Where'd he get that? Good parents, but that ain't all. Okay? When, when, you're, when you're hearing songs and we're singing or you're listening to somebody else sing and, and your old foot gets to going, you know, and we fight it because we're just self-controlled, you know, we, we are just spiritually constipated as we can get. And, and so, you know, when you're hearing a good song, that's a new term. Uh, study that one in Bible school. Uh, and so you tapping and you're feeling it, and man, you're just fighting to hold it back, and, and you just want to yell between verses, hallelujah, that's good stuff, man. You might just be resisting the Holy Spirit. Because, folks, do you really want to say I get more excited over Willie Nelson than I do God's gospel? You want to clap, clap. You feel it. And then these fellows start speaking in tongues. Okay? I've never done that personally. I'm not going to tell somebody else they hadn't, but I've never done that personally. But these guys, they're speaking in, in, in tongues. Now, sometimes that might be a foreign language. Sometimes that might be a language that other people are hearing in their own language. But a crowd comes around, and everybody's watching this stuff. And if you'll read Acts chapter 2, and I want you to after church today, you'll see this long list of where all these people are from, and it's not even a complete list. There's not enough tongue speakers there to speak individually one-on-one -on -one to every language there. That means these folks are saying stuff, and regardless of what they're saying, it's still hitting people's ears according to their language. Between those mouths and their ears, they hear what they need to hear. And sometimes we go, well, I've never seen anybody speak in tongues, or I don't speak in tongues, therefore that doesn't happen anymore. Don't put the Spirit in a bottle. Folks, it happens every Sunday. 
every Sunday. It happens all week long. When Mary read that scripture just then, some of you are in a place in your life where you needed that. Some of you not. Some of you soaked it in and thought, I wonder what that means. Some of you didn't hear it at all. Sometimes we miss the Spirit or fight against Him. Sometimes when you hear a scripture in your nine, it sounds like one thing. When you hear it when you're 30, it sounds like another. And when you hear it when you're 85, it sounds like a whole other thing. How'd that happen? Do you really have to guess? So many times in preaching, people will say, man, when you said this, I'm saved. I said something else and you heard what you needed to hear. You think that was luck? It's still happening, folks. It just doesn't look exactly the same. It may not always fit here. And so the Spirit will do it differently. And He'll let you hear what you need to hear, whether that's a direct quotation of Scripture or maybe it's an application of Scripture that makes a spiritual point. And you go, wow, that really affected me today. Don't give me the credit for that. I don't deserve it. I didn't do nothing. Still moving. This week I went Wednesday. I got a call from one of my soldiers, recently retired, true American hero, absolute true American hero. Uh, second highest medal that can be given to a soldier he was given. His daughter, who I happen to really, really love, I've been close to this family since the first time I went and worked with them. At that time, his daughter was six. And they were a blended family, just getting started, lots of battles, and we went through the battles together. And one day I told that little girl, I said, you know, I got four little girls, and I know how to braid hair. She said, no, you don't. I said, yes, I do. I turned her into Princess Leia right there in the lobby and spent time and played. And, and, and I'd talked to them on and off through all the years. And uh, she's 18 now. They had moved, and she went back home to finish her senior year of high school. And last week, on, on Valentine's Day, two weeks ago, she had a car accident. And she went off the road. She's 18 now. She went off the road. She hit a tree at about 60. Uh, didn't have her seatbelt on. She went straight through the windshield, hit the tree face first. Should have probably died. There's no reason really why she lived. It just tore to pieces. She lost her left eye. They don't know about the right eye. Uh, don't know how much she's going to be able to see when she finally gets that open. Jaws to pieces, tore skin up, tore up nearly every bone you can break. Lost most of her teeth. Uh, broken fingers, wrist, rest of her seems to be okay. But she didn't wake up for the first week, and the doctor said that's a really bad sign. The first day is critical. First week, extremely critical. She didn't wake up. So I flew out this, this Wednesday and uh, to the East Coast and came on Thursday night because I wanted to see her. And the family wanted me there, and I've talked to her a lot through the years, and she knows my voice. And when I got there Wednesday night, I found out that she had just squeezed her mama's hand, and that's a really good thing. And she seemed to recognize her mom. She, was trying, she, she mouthed a kiss to her mom, but that's all she could do. She's just wired to everything, but it's, she has a trach in. She can't really talk, but they can put a trach in that allows you to talk. And so I went in to see her, and I, I, the first time I talked to her, I went in and I grabbed her hand, and she squeezed it back, and of course she didn't know who it was, so I didn't know if that had been voluntary or not. I said, this is Eric Tuff. Remember me? She squeezed my hand. She tried to lift up a little bit. So I left out after a little bit of talking to her and visiting. And before I left that night, it's about 11.30 at night. You've got to go to the door, and you have to tell them who you are and why you're there, and you have to give them a, a password in order to get into the uh, adult trauma unit. So I went in, and she was extremely agitated. I mean, she was, she was, obviously she's in pain. She probably she doesn't know why she's blind. She doesn't know what's going on. She's in bad shape, and so she's agitated, and she's moving, and she's pulling at everything, and she's threatening to pull out a lot of the tubes and devices that are on her. 
and the nurse was saying, it's probably not a good time to visit because, boy, we, we got to get her calmed down fast, but I can't get anything in her right now. And I kneeled beside her bed, and I put my head beside her head. And I sang, everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be all right. You hold me in. Tell the storm is gone. Everything's going to be all right. Completely calmed down. And the nurse gave her her medicine. And she was all right. Now, folks, do you think I got that kind of power? No. I sure as heck don't sing that good. That's the Holy Spirit. That's a loud wind running in your room that just gives you peace. That's speaking in a language that I don't know that went into a traumatized brain that would get addled again later on. But for a while, that needed to happen. It happened. And when this happened on the day of Pentecost, those that were listening, that were resistant to the Spirit, said, these fellows are drunk. They're laughing at them. They're like, these fellows are drunk, man. There's something wrong with these people. Now, in Texanese, here's how we say it. They ain't right. Okay, so all the people listening are going, they ain't right. And, folks, that still happens today. If you think that doesn't happen today, how often do people look at Christians who have joy and peace and love and unity, and so those people ain't right. His mama just died, and he's celebrating her life. Something wrong with that. Why do you have peace? You just lost your job, and you got nothing to do, and your life is falling apart, and you're still praising God. What's up with you people? How is it that you people walk into church with all the dissension in the world today, with all the political differences, with all the religious arguments we got about these days? How come you people love each other, and you can sit down and have a chicken strip together and not fight? Jesus. Jesus. And so Peter gets up with all of his graciousness now, which that's a miracle too. He's not cutting off anybody's ear today. Peter gets up and says, fellas, we're not drunk. See, he doesn't say this, but this is good Greek. Good gravy. It's nine in the morning. You know, I'm sure Peter's wanting to say, I've been known to have a little glass of wine at nighttime, but not with my eggs, fellas. It's nine in the morning. This is what the prophet Joel told you about. Joel told you this was going to happen. Joel said a long time ago, when the Messiah comes, he is going to pour out his spirit on all the believers. This is just the fulfillment of prophecy. And here's what Joel said. Joel said, your sons and your daughters were prophesied. When the spirit comes, sons and daughters are going to prophesy. Your young men and your old men are going to dream dreams and have visions. Now talk to me. We're supposed to be having dreams and visions, folks. Your dreams and visions, not mine. The church is not supposed to be preacher-led. It's supposed to be Holy Spirit-driven. It's supposed to be all of us having visions and dreams and dreaming of what this church can be and visions of what we can do. All we talk about in the business world today is visionary leadership. Well, we need it in the church, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And some folks need to be saying, this is what we ought to do, and I'm going to go glory, hallelujah, God bless you, go do it. Take care of dreams and visions. And then he says, and your men and women will prophesy. And you will see wonders. It still happens. Folks, how wondrous is it that a church this small, two every two Wednesdays, can have 75 cars line up and feed them all? It's the same thing. It, it, it's the same type of things. We're seeing these wonders. How can a church this size feed 110 people, 110 families at Thanksgiving time? When churches of 4,000 can't do that. That's not us, that's not our glory, that's God empowering us and pouring his spirit out to say, go do what's right for this world. That's what he's looking for from us. It's the spirit. 
And then as Peter continues to preach, he says, all right now, this Jesus who God certified, who God laid his hands on him, this Jesus who God turned over to you, you turned over to evil men and they killed him. They killed him. And then he quotes David. He says, even King David was looking forward to the time of Jesus. See, they worship David. We're the sons of David. We're the sons of Abraham. We're Jews. We got all this stuff, and Peter is saying, even David was looking forward to Jesus coming. And he did, and he's here. And he didn't die. Death couldn't hold him. Death couldn't defeat him. The grave couldn't hold him. David was looking for it, and now he's here. Okay, but he's not here. Where is he? Peter says he's on the right-hand side of God. Right now, Jesus is on the right-hand side of God, and what's he doing? Read your text. He's pouring out his spirit. That's what Jesus is doing. He's pouring his spirit out so we can keep doing what he did. Taking care of folks and healing folks and sharing the gospel and loving up on folks and bringing them in and helping people get past their stuff. And he says in no uncertain terms, Jesus is Lord. Jesus, whom you crucified, God has made him both Lord and Christ, Savior and Lord. And that gets them. So they say, man, they're a little bit scared probably. And they say, man, what do we got to do? What do we got to do? All right, now, Acts 2.38, we've camped on this one for a long time. What do we got to do? All right, so, so Peter says, repent. Folks, that does not necessarily mean you're sorrowful. It might be. But it means you change your mind. You turn around. So here you were. You rejected Jesus. You had him killed because you thought he was a liar. Now you believe he's the son of God. You have just repented. You changed your mind. It's like when a married person says, I think my wife should meet all of my needs. And one day he finally grows up and said, I'm supposed to meet all her needs. We're supposed to beat each other to the serve. You just repented. And Peter says, repent and be immersed to the, to the forgiveness of your sins. Repent, be immersed. doesn't really mean for, it means unto the forgiveness of your sins. But then he says this, don't read part A and cut off part B. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Folks, it ain't much gift if the box is empty. You'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the promise is to everyone. There's nobody excluded. Nobody too far, nobody too dirty, nobody too harm, nobody anything. It's for everybody. And now listen, Peter, it says, he pled with them. Sometimes we miss this. After he says all this, he pleads with them. And on that day, 3,000 joined their number. And he still wants to do it and still can. And I want you to read now a, a familiar passage, but I want us to hear what the Holy Spirit does among a people. Listen to the end of the, of the chapter. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold their property and their possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That wasn't love. It wasn't chance. It was the intent and the desire of the Holy Spirit and what he wanted to do among us. What we're going to do now, folks, is I don't always give an invitation. You know that because you can do an invitation anytime you want to. Uh, we're going to listen to a song here in a moment, and it's only about three minutes. But I want us to take a moment. If you need to reflect, then reflect. I want you to look around. If there's somebody here you don't know in these three minutes, go greet them. If you need somebody to pray for you, get the person next to you and say, hey, let's pray together. If you, if you see somebody you had not seen in a little bit, go talk to them a little bit. Three minutes, go give somebody a hug. All of us can use a hug sometimes, right? Go, go shake somebody's hand. Go, go ask somebody how they're doing and really care. 
Uh, if you need to be a Christian today, come grab me, grab anybody. Say, hey, today's the day, man. I'm doing that Acts 2.38 thing right now. We'll do that. But just spend some time with each other, fellowship with each other for three minutes. Then what we're going to do is Ray is going to lead us in a very special song to celebrate who we are and what God has done for us. And Tyler's going to come up and make us some comments. And then Caleb's going to give us a benediction to get us out of here. So let's stand and listen to this song and walk around and say hi to somebody.